Well, good morning. This is Pastor Marvin Osborne with First Baptist Church of Birmingham, Ohio, and I hope you're well today. Today we're going to talk about the last key to spiritual success. Remember we said that what separates the average believer from those who have, who have really made contributions to the kingdom of God while, on the, while they were on the earth? What separates them from you and I? And we said that there are keys that all of us must uh, use in order to, uh, or apply to our life in order for us to grow and be everything that God wants us to be. These are our keys that, that unquestionably uh, are, are necessary for all of us to grow. We talk about the Word of God, we talk about prayer, we talk about getting rid of the weights and the sins, we talk about um, uh, so many other, so many other things there, and, and today we want to talk about uh, the the key of multiplication, of sharing Christ. And this is really a two-parter. So we'll, we'll start with this one here and this week. And next week, Lord willing, we'll pick back up with it. And I hope you'll grab on to it. I hope you uh, get a piece of paper and, and write out some stuff because the statistics are alarming. The fact is, is that the birth rate is outweighing the conversion rate of those coming to Christ uh, by a great bit. We are losing ground as it, as it pertains to those coming to Christ and, and those who are walking this planet. We're reaching less and less people than we once did, uh, percentage-wise. And so it's important that you and I understand our role, our responsibility, and this key is essential. Everybody must reach somebody with the kingdom of God. And the fact is, is that none of us can save anybody, right? But it is a fact that God has called all of us to share the gospel, to get people under the influence of the gospel while we can. Statistics indicate there are 107 people who enter into eternity who will die every minute. 107 people will die in the next 60 seconds. That's 56 million people around the world enter into eternity, either into hell or to heaven, a uh, vast majority into hell, uh, the moment they close their eyes, the moment their heartbeat stops in this lifetime. Statistics indicate that only 23% of Americans are regular church attenders. Only 23, about uh, less than one in four, uh, attend church regularly. And 80% of those uh, who do attend church attend a mega church. Now we know that there are many good churches out there who are continuing to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, but that's really, the mega church is a new phenomenon. Uh, and, and throughout the church age, there was uh, there were a few churches that would be considered mega, but most churches would have been uh, smaller churches where there was fellowship, there was uh, accountability, there was the Word of God being preached. And mega churches, a lot of that is lost, isn't it? And so we're 80% of those who do attend church are attending a mega church. Statistics indicate that our conversion rate, as I said before it is not keeping up with the birth rate. We are losing ground. We're not reaching people as we once did. Only 4% of American teens will end up being Bible-believing Christians. Only 4%. As a matter of fact, the those who will come to Christ sometime throughout their a uh, throughout their lifetime uh, 80% of those will come to Christ before their 18th birthday. And so if we don't reach them while they're young and keep them while they're young, you know, the church is going to continue to, to, to die out. Now, the church will never die out, will it? But we understand that there are a lot of professors out there, a lot of people who say they believe in Christ, even among the, the 23%. A uh, vast majority of those really don't know Christ. Uh, we are, the fact is, is that we are losing ground. Millions are dying without Christ. Min millions are entering into an eternity in hell. 
and the church sits back and does nothing or very little. Matthew 9, 35 through 38, Jesus uh, gives us uh, our calling. He says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto the shepherds, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Matthew 9, 35-38. You know what? Jesus saw the multitudes. He had compassion on them. And he says, you and I must be the laborers that we're praying about. There are only two things, only two eternal things that will outlive us in this world. You know what? Uh, the cars we buy will end up in the junkyard. The house we, uh, we, we live in will be lived in by someone else or go to termites or some natural disaster or in a fire or any number of things. These things aren't meant to last, are they? The clothes we wear or whatever, they're not going to last. There are only two, two eternal things in this world, and that's the word of God and the souls of men. Jesus saw the multitude. He saw all these people who were lost and in need of, of the shepherd, Jesus Christ, and he says we need to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. And you know what? We are the answer to that prayer. You and I are the answer. He compels you and I. Yet, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ said, uh, once they uh, published, said that, that only 2% of Christians, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are followers of Christ, only 2% of those share their faith on a regular basis. It's a natural part of who they are. 95% of Christians will never lead someone to Christ. 95% of Christians will never lead someone to Christ. They're not going to lead their children. They're not going to lead their spouse. They're not going to lead their grandchildren. They're not going to lead their neighbor. They're not going to lead their, their co-worker. You know what? They're going to leave this world alone and not bring anyone into eternity with them. Yet the statistics indicate that the average Christian knows nine, nine, nine unchurched or unsaved people that they care about. It's in their their sphere of, of influence. It's the people they care about. Their children, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren, their co-workers. They know nine people that they care about that are either unchurched or saved and they've fallen away from church, or they've never uh, trusted Christ as their Savior, and, and, and they do, 95% of people will never do anything to reach them for Christ. Remember, there are only two eternal things that really matter in this world. The, the Word of God and the souls of men. So the question comes in. This spiritual key that is so vital to all of us. Number, why are we so reluctant to share our faith in Jesus Christ. Why? What is it about our faith that we somehow cower back from and, and refuse to share Jesus with others? I believe, number one, we worry about what other people think. We're, we're concerned about how what they think about us. We share Christ in the workplace and all of a sudden we're, uh, we're laughed at or we're mocked or we still have to uh, work with these people for another, uh, you know, eight hours a day for the for the majority of our life, and they will mock us. Well, number two, we're worried about rejection. We're worried that people are going to say, no, that's not for me. Hey, that's good enough for you. That's not good enough for me. We, we're worried about being rejected. We're worried about being asked something that we don't understand, that we, we can't answer. We get that all the time. People, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, have a novice understanding of the word of God or they have a novice they've been around somebody who has questions you know they've got the questions and we're, we're worried about them asking a question that we can't answer and uh, 
uh, and I, I really think that we have a misconception of what true evangelism is, what it truly is means to share your faith. The word evangelism comes from the Greek word, which means good news, good news. It, it, that's where we get the word gospel. Good news, God, the gospel means good news. It is a, is it, evangelism is nothing more than expressing and giving people the good news about Jesus Christ. We are expressing, we are sharing Jesus Christ with someone else. Hey, I've got good news for you today. Jesus loves you. I've got good news for you today that Jesus cares about you. We have good news to share with people in a world that's filled with bad news. You look at the, the, the newscast today filled with negative reports about everything because crisis sells, blood sells. But when you have the, the cure for man's ills, you know what? Um, that doesn't sell. But people are so hungry for it. We can tell people that God loves you. Hey, that's good news. You may be live in a world today where no one loves you. You feel alone. You feel that the world is against you. But let me tell you this. God loves you. God loves you. God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son, God the Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He willingly laid down his life on the cross. He was buried. He resurrected. Why? He's going to wipe out your sin debt and adopt you and make you a child of God. He wants to give you eternal life. Hey, my friends, that's good news. That's good news. This spiritual key, this key to your spiritual growth is absolutely essential. Why? Because uh, healthy beings multiply. If you have a, a, a healthy uh, dog, you know, a, a healthy dog will multiply. A healthy uh, female will multiply if she so chooses. And a, ha a healthy believer will also multiply in the fact that they, they desire to uh, replicate their experience with Jesus Christ in the life of someone else. They want to share the good news. This spiritual key deals with the, the spiritual condition, the spiritual destination of your friends and your relatives and your associates and neighbors. It is outreach. It is absolutely essential to your spiritual growth and the spiritual destination of those you care about. Statistics indicate that the average Christian, as we said, knows nine, nine unchurched or unsaved people. If we don't invite them uh, to, to come to church, statistics indicate that they're, they're probably not coming to church. Rarely will an unchurched person get up on a Sunday morning and say, hey, let's go to church, unless someone invites them. If we don't share Christ with them, who will? Who will? If we if they don't receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, we know that they will die and go to hell. Those are the facts. There is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by me. It is only through Jesus Christ. You may have a godly, or not a godly, you may have a good grandmother, a a a, a woman who worked hard her whole life and, and was a great provider and, and was loving and caring and did and sacrificed so many things. But if she does not know Jesus Christ as her Savior, she's going to die and go to hell. And that's the fact of the matter. Jesus is the only way. And you and I have the opportunity to share that good news with Jesus Christ. That God loves them. Evangelism is simply um, sharing good news. As one person put it, evangelism is one beggar giving another beggar a piece of bread. You see, we were once beggars too uh, before we trusted Christ. But now we found a place 
where we can get the bread. And now we share that bread with someone else. Amen. We need church believers. We need to be about our father's business. We need to be about our father's business. Listen, Jesus, only Jesus can save a lost soul. Only Jesus can deliver the alcoholic. Only Jesus can uh, deliver the, the sex ad uh, addict. Only Jesus can, um, can uh, uh, deliver the drug addict. Only Jesus can help this country. Only Jesus can set us on the right course. You and I have the uh, responsibility to be about our Father's business and share this good news that Jesus is the answer to man's ills. You know what? Alcoholics Anonymous does an amazing job. Uh, they can change physical destinies, but they cannot change eternal destinies. Only Jesus can do that. Psychiatrists can help people with mental disorders, but they can't, uh, they can't help someone with eternal disorders. Only do doctors can help physical healing, but only Jesus can give them spiritual healings. Only Jesus can cure man's greatest problem, and that's the problem of sin. And, and God has given you and I, has given believers, doesn't matter if you're educated, doesn't matter if you're white, brown, black, yellow, or red. It doesn't matter if you live in the country, you live in the city. It doesn't matter how much money you have. If, you're, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, Christ has given you and I the responsibility to share the good news to others. Romans 10, 9 and, uh, I'm sorry, 10, 14 through 17. He says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You, uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans is saying, you and I have a responsibility. We have, we have the keys to eternal life. That God has allowed us, you and I, as mortal beings, to be part of the eternal process of bringing people or sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the lost. Aren't you glad someone shared Christ with you? Aren't you glad someone invited you to a Bible preaching church where you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? If so, why aren't you doing the same thing? Why aren't you bringing people in where they, uh, where they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? You and I possess the keys to the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your lost loved ones cannot be saved until someone shares the gospel with them. God is not going to uh, appear to them in a vision. He's not going to do, you know, he's going to use you. He's going to use me. He's going to use uh, believers to share the good news with them. You can pass a track to them. You can invite them to church. You can do any number of things. Share a video. Share this video. That they get under the influence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are part of God's plan. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 says, You are God's masterpiece. You are created in Christ Jesus for good works. The good works of sharing the gospel with someone else. You are valuable to Almighty God. So what are, what are some of the misconceptions? Number one, we need to remember that salvation is a process and not just an event. It is a process. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 5-8. It says, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. 
I have planted, Apollos has watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 8. What is he saying? He says that uh, he says that there's a process here. Paul planted, Paul came in and began to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with this with this community here. And then Apollos came and he began to share Christ with them and, he, and uh, with those same people, and and they and they got saved. So was it Paul that led them to Christ? Was it Apollos who led them to Christ, or was it God? And the answer is yes. You see, we all are part of the, uh, the the process of leading someone to Christ. You may share Christ with someone, and they never receive um, salvation, but in comes someone else behind you, and they begin to uh, minister to that same person, and they receive Christ. And the Bible says you're going to receive your reward. The person who who sows the seeds and those who comes and does the harvesting, there is one. There's there's one reward for all of them, and that's because they've been part of the the, the saving process. The, listen, the fact is is that God has not called you to save anybody. He's not called me to save anybody, but He has called you and I to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A couple of weeks ago, I, when we were talking about prayer, remember I talked about this lady in our church who. Um, who was who had prayed for her unsaved husband for decades? For decades, she witnessed to them. She would bring him to church on on special occasions, and he would hear the gospel. I'd give the gospel. He never responded. Never responded. Nice guy. I liked him, and uh, but never responded until he got sick. And he's well in his late seventies, early eighties, or whatever it was. And and uh, and he's laying there in bed. And I'm I went in to pray over him before his operation. And I looked down at him and I said, are you ready to receive Christ? And, you know, and much to my surprise, and I think the surprise of his wife, who's sitting there, had prayed over him for all those decades, um, and, and he, he said yes. And you know what? That man, who was a, a big, strong farmer, had worked hard all of his life, he grabbed onto my hand, and he prayed to receive Christ right there. You know what the Bible says? That, that his wife had, had, had planted and continued to plant. And they had watered. And all of a sudden, God just used me. And I was the right person at the right time to lead him to Christ. And you don't know uh, who has been there before. You and I, uh, we don't save anybody. There's, it's a process, isn't it? Uh, of God bringing people uh, into your life and 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 sharing the good news with you, sharing the good news with you. I remember as a school principal one time, I had this man come in and uh, is a parent of a of one of our students, and he is you know I try to really um, befriend the parents there, and and he was talking about an upcoming operation, and he said that. Um, uh, you know, he was concerned about this operation that they, they said he said that he was going to need. And then I began to share Christ with him right there in that public school setting and uh, sharing Christ with him. And I said, are you say, are you sure you're saved? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? And he says, I don't know. I don't know. And said, let's go in this back room. And uh, why don't you pray and receive Christ as your Savior today? You know what? He walked back there, this big, strong man. Had no reason to fear that, uh, be concerned about that operation. And he prayed to receive Christ. And you know what? That guy died. He died as a result of that, uh, that surgery. And you know what? There had been a process up until that time. God had been working on his heart. He, God gave him an inkling that this thing was not going to turn out too well. God gave him one more chance receive Christ as their Savior. You and I have an opportunity just to share, to plant the seeds, to uh, to be there when people ask questions and, and want to, uh, us to pray for them and to share the good news. I've got good news for you. Your, your, your situation may seem desperate, but God has a plan for you. 
God can deliver you. Are you saved? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? It is a process, as we read in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 8. Rarely does someone receive Christ on the first um, hearing of the gospel. It's usually uh, they've heard it, and they've heard it, and the Word of God and, and the Spirit of God begins to convict them. Listen, we don't need to memorize any sales pitch. And I think we got into a, uh, there was a quandary about that back in the 80s and the 70s, you know, with some of the programs that were out there. We It was a sales pitch. We were getting people to, to buy into something, and that's not it. That's not the gospel. The gospel is someone understanding that they are lost and they're damned to hell, that they need to repent of their sins and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. We're going to die and, and spend eternity apart from Jesus Christ. Salvation is a process. You and I are part of the process, as Paul was, as Apollos was, and uh, but it is God who gives the increase. We just have to do as God opens the door for us to do. We don't have to you know, slam in any doors. We don't have to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, try to force the gospel into every conversation. Let the Spirit of God, let the Spirit of God direct us in communicating the gospel with with others. However, although the salvation is a process and not just an event, remember that salvation is an event. It is an event. Uh, many have, uh, it is not just a simple prayer. You know, a lot of people have almost made the sinner's prayer magic words, and we don't see the sinner's prayer in the, uh, in, in the Bible. We've done that. I don't think there's anything wrong with it other than if we think that someone just saying those words apart from truly meaning them uh, will save them, then something's wrong with that. We all must come to the point where the where Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, Jesus, you are Lord, and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's Romans 10, 9 and 10. He says, it's not enough just to say that Jesus Christ is, is Lord, but it's also a matter of what we believe. Those words are, are meaningless unless, unless we truly believe that, G, that God hath raised Jesus from the dead. That he truly is say, uh, uh, the the propitiation or the covering of our sins. That if we put our faith and trust in him, we will be saved. Salvation entails, number one, a recognition that we are lost apart from Jesus Christ. No matter what uh, charitable deeds we may have done, no matter how good people may think about us, the fact is that all of us are low down, stinking sinners apart from Jesus Christ. And we must understand that, uh, that as long as we have that sin, we are lost and damned to hell. We must repent. God, I'm tired of going this same way. I'm tired of my, 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 sin, uh, my sinful habits. God, I'm sorry for the things that I've done. We need to repent of our sins. Salvation also entails the verbal confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is who the Bible says he is. He is God the Son, the Son of God, who was born of a virgin, who lived that sinless life, who willingly laid down his life and died on the cross and resurrected from the grave. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that Christ has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It is a confession. That's where that prayer comes in. I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is no other. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by him and him alone. It is that outward confession. I believe he is who he says he is. I believe that he died and resurrected from the grave. And now I receive him as my Lord and Savior. To verbally confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is to believe what the Bible says about him. That he is who he is. 
son of God, and he did what he did in order to purchase my salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Salvation is not just an event. It's a process. Yet it entails an event. It is the time where you and I understand that God has been working on me all this time. And I believe that he is who he says he is. And now I verbally receive him as Savior. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you 100% sure you're saved? Why don't you pray and receive him as your Savior today? Why don't you say, dear God, I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin and receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. Please come into my life now and save me. Make me yours now and forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen? Amen. Well, next week we'll pick, Lord willing, we'll pick right up on this again. And But let me ask you this. Let me encourage you, give you some homework. Why don't you identify those people in your sphere of influence, those people you care about, the people you, you, um, you pray for. Begin to write down their names. This is indicate you know nine people that way. Nine people that are unchurched or unsaved. Why don't you make a call to them and invite them to your church this week? Invite them to church. At the church, have a cookout. At the church, um, you know, go to go to Arby's, whatever. Get them in church. Get them to a place where they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that you are now uh, part of God's process of being about our Father's business. Listen, we're losing ground and we're losing time. I believe that Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church, is coming soon. We need to reach as many people, share the gospel with as many people as we can, while we can. Amen? Let's pick back up on this next week. Remember, um, get in your church, in your local church. And if you're in northern Ohio, I invite you to come to First Baptist Church of Birmingham, Ohio, between Wakeman and Birmingham, and uh, Wakeman and Vermilion on State Route 60, Church at 11. Remember that God loves you. And I love you as well. And I'll talk to you soon.